certain for the people who won't be here, then they can actually hear the exact same thing. So um, Mrs. Johns has already sent out information regarding testing. Just to be clear and make sure everybody's on the same page, make sure that you're, you are like visible in the camera. So like if I start, like you guys can see me here, but if all of a sudden I do this, can you see me? No. Exactly. So, you know, they go back and look at the videos. Prep you looks at the videos. Um, you know, we have, we have several layers of people looking at the videos. So if you start here and then you end up over here, then you have gone out of frame. So I don't know what you're doing over here, right? You know, you can't have notes um, or anything like that, as tempting as it may be. Do not have any notes, be flipping through pages or anything of that nature. You know, two and three screens or monitors and all of that business. Um, we're exiting folks out the program. So just, it's a district policy, academic honesty or academic integrity. So I just want you guys to not be caught in, in that situation. So, you know, I know you want to graduate but think of what you are trading. Um, you're trading potentially not ever being certified as a healthcare provider. That's what you're really giving up. So I'd rather repeat a semester if that's what I needed to do versus lose any opportunity to ever be what it is that I want to be. And, you know, I teach for, the, I teach EMTs and I know it's tempting for them to, however, you know, that academic policy, we have, there's been some folks who will never be certified in EMS period. And there's some folks that had an initial certification as an EMT in the paramedic program and, you know, displayed this, this uh, honest integrity and they, their EMT was stripped. So that means that they can't, they are no longer an EMT. So let's not put ourselves in that predicament. Nothing is ever worth, it's almost like going to jail for breach of peace. That's the lamest thing you could ever get arrested for. Not that I've ever been arrested, but I have uh, several police officers in my family. So we talk about that all the time. All right, so uh, let's try and go back to where we were yesterday when we were having some, uh, had that brain overload working, you know, so much information. And as I said previously, prior to, you know, once we get to this portion, once spring break hit, everything was going to be quick, 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 quick. And if you haven't noticed it, then I think you fell asleep, but hopefully you did notice that things are moving rapidly. So they're literally on fire. So I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna start over at the beginning, like we did yesterday. And then we're gonna proceed from there. Any other questions before we get crack a -lack in? All right, so share screen, we share this PowerPoint. And then I'll make this bigger. So just to go back and review basic ECGs, which is what we talked about, started yesterday. First slide, these are the rules. So you need to commit them to memory. Okay, so you need to know your basic rules for ECG interpretation. And as you can see here, you were looking at, is it regular? So is the distance between each R wave the same or relatively the same? It, it can be off by one box and that won't be a big deal. Do we have a P wave that's round and upright in front of every QRS, even if it's not round and upright, like a normal P wave should be, does one exist in front of every QRS complex? Then we're going to calculate the rate using the R to R method and multiply by 10, but we need a fully conducted beat in order to calculate the rate. Then we're going to look at the PR interval. So it's going to be the measurement from the beginning of the P to the end of the P and right before the QRS component. Uh, it's right near the QRS component. And the Q is the first downward reflection, and I'll be more specific in pointing that out to you as we go through the PowerPoint. But this is normal. So 0 .0, 0 0.12 to 0 0.20, that's the normal PR interval. Um, 
QRS should be within normal limits, which would be 0 .0, 0 0.08 to 0 0.12. And then no ectopy, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of strips where there's some ectopy. And then we're gonna make our interpretation. So the next thing that I showed you guys is, you know, you have this EKG paper, this grid, and what this is showing you is one big box is one of these, you can see the darker red, this is one big box that has one, two, three, four, five boxes in it. So if your P wave goes the whole length of that box, then your PR interval is 0 0.20. Then these itty bitty boxes, oh, hold on. Then you have these itty bitty boxes, so right here. So this little small one is, is uh, 0 0.02 for one small square. But that's up here. They should be actually 0 0.04. So they're looking at units. It should be 0 0.04, not 0 0.2, um, but 0 0.04. So let's move here. This is our R method. There's this other ways, but this is R to R. So here we'd be counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Multiply that times 10, and that would be a, roughly 90 beats. You're actually getting an average. So let's go back to the paper. That point two is the whole length of this box, but one itty bitty box is 0 0.04 seconds as written down here. So P wave, what does that represent? What does the P wave represent? Is it the SA node? It's not the SA node. Atrial repolarization? Actually, atrial depolarization. So <clears throat> the P wave is letting us know that the atria has been depolarized or it contracted. All right, so what does the QRS, and as you can see here, Q is the first downward reflection, then R, then S, and then we have a change in trajectory here and where the point where where it's going straight but then eventually veers off that is known as the j point it's where the first change in direction happened that will be the j point what does the qrs represent ventricular depolarization so it's ventricular depolarization so the qrs lets you know that the signal from the sa node has now been accepted by the av node so the QRS equals ventricular okay and so our T wave is indicative to what ventricular repolarization so this is ventricular repolarization now when do the when does the atria repolarize in the QRS as well. Correct, so the same time the QRS or the same time the ventricles are depolarizing, is when the atria are repolarizing, but you can't see the voltage in that. There's no extra, there's no extra wave. So here, this actually shows the U wave where you can kind of put a little pill here on the inside. 
what does the U wave represent if you actually have that? It doesn't always exist, but it exists in this condition. Hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Okay. So that's what all this means. Now here, the T wave should be rounded and upright, which it is. If it was peaked, then that would be what? Hyper. That's hyperkalemia. So uh, when people are looking at, uh, or when physicians are looking at whether a person's having a heart attack, then they're going to look at the ST segment and or the T wave. So what will happen here is instead of this T wave being upright, it would actually invert and it would be a depression. That's how you know you have cardiac ischemia because instead of the T wave being rounded and upright, it would literally be a mirror replica of itself but below the isoelectric line. That's the first sign with uh, when you have T wave inversion. This is cardiac ischemia. So the concern where you're looking at if it's a heart attack or an MI, they're looking at ST segment what? Depression? Elevation. Elevation. So here, if this was our isoelectric line, then that ST segment where it, it will be up here at least one, one to two boxes. So to be a higher, this is below the isoelectric line or it's actually above here, but this as you, if, if it was an MI, then this point would be up here versus down here, okay? All right, so let's look at some basic rhythms. So this is where we started yesterday. I think we only got through the first three or four, so I'm gonna actually minimize that. All right, so is it regular? And what do I mean by regular? So if you held up to your screen a, a, a piece of a paper, like an edge of a paper, envelope, whatever, you put a mark on your paper for this one and a mark on your paper for this one, and then you take it and you march it out. So from here to here, then you slide it over to see if these two have the same distance, if these two hit on the same spot on your paper, all the way across, that lets you know that it's regular. The next thing we're looking for a P wave, is there a P in front of every QRS in the strip? Yes. Yes, there is. There is a P wave in front of every QRS in the strip. All right, what is our rate? Can we count the first and the last beat, yes or no? No. No, no we can't. So we can count everything in between. How many R waves do we count? 11. So 11 times 10 is? 110. 110. So do we have any ectopic beats? Does anything in here look abnormal? No. No. So when we're doing our PR interval, so we're gonna use the, we're gonna use this fourth beat because this P wave actually starts on the line. Is it less than 0 0.20, yes or no? Yes. Yes, it is. Is the QRS between 0 0.08 and 0 0.12? Yes. Yes, it is. So we have a narrow QRS, which we should. We have a P wave in front of every QRS that's rounded and upright. We have a T wave that's rounded and upright. Our rate's just fast. What is this? Tachycardia. Tachycardia? Sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia. So that, that would be your final interpretation. Okay, so let's do the next one. Is this regular? No. This is an irregular rhythm. 
So even if it is irregular, is it regularly or irregularly irregular? Irregular. So this is an irregularly irregular rather rhythm, rather than. Okay, is there a P wave in front of every QRS? No. I have one no. I say yes. And we have a yes. I say no. I say no. That last one looks funky. Let's see. I don't know if we can do polls in here. Let's see. I'm looking. No. Um, I like uh, Blackboard Collaborate because you could at least do polls, but we can't do polls. Okay, so it doesn't matter. No, there is not a P wave in front of every QRS, not for this rhythm. It's irregularly irregular, so we can't measure the PR interval, but our QRS, it does look to be less than, or at least between 0 0.08 and 0 0.12, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, so what is this rhythm? AFib. This is atrial fibrillation. So if you are if you are wondering what does atrial fibrillation looks like, this is one version of atrial fibrillation, and you really can't calculate an R, uh, you know, your rhythm. It's going to be the average of all of these, but this looks like at about sixty. That's the average rate, but between here and here, so this would be three hundred, one fifty, one hundred. This is about seventy five from this from beat number one to beat number two, but from beat number two to beat number three, so 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, we're almost in the 40s here. And then this would be much longer. <coughs> so from beat three to beat four. So this is why the average rate, they do an average rate here. We still kind of do it the same but you won't have to worry about this. Why did I show you this? See, let me see if you remember what I told you in the beginning when I started talking about ECGs. Which patient population that, that we spoke of, oh, that's a part of perfusion, typically may have AFib? Your CHFers. Your CHF, your, your, your heart failures. Should be just HF, heart failure patients. That's the reason why I brought it up. This can bring on clots. So when now we're worried about strokes. We're also worried about um, pulmonary embolisms. So this, and heart attacks, because this stuff is so irregular, but this is the reason why I put this here. All right, so what is this rhythm? First of all, is it regular? Yes. It is regular. Is there a P wave in front of every QRS? No. No, there are no P waves. Is your Q less than 0.12? Your QRS. Yeah. No, so you would be measuring from, let's see if I can find one of these. It's, so starting from here to here, we're almost a whole, a whole square, one of these squares here. So that would be definitely greater than 0.12 because we're at about four or five squares. So we have no P waves, it's regular. We can't do a PR interval. We have a wide and bizarre QRS. What is this rhythm? ETEC. Say that again, please. Uh, ventricular tachycardia. This is ventricular tachycardia. Okay. This is one form of ventricular tachycardia. And what I mean by one form is that those QRSs can look different uh, and not necessarily like this. So we're going to move on. Next one. What is this? so? Do is this rate regular? So from beats one to two, two to three, 
3 to 4, is it regular? Yes. It is regular. So if you were to take your paper, hold it up from here, make a mark on your paper where this uh, point is and make a mark on your paper where this point is and you march it out, they're going to be relatively regular. Okay. Now I can tell you the slower the heart rate gets, then the P wave starts to flatten and become longer. So, and the QRS can, can get a little bit wider. So here we do, is our QRS interval, of, um, is that less than 0.12 and greater than 0 0.08? And so, okay, it is. So we looked at regularity, we looked at a P wave in front of every QRS. What's our rate? So can we count this first box, yes or no? Actually, we can. So if you look at it, it's very, all of these uh, P waves are pretty much the same. So it's not like you got it and the, it, the P wave was here. So what's your rate? Four times 10 is? 40. 40, what's your interpretation of this strip? Sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia. Sinus bradycardia. Why can't you say it's normal sinus? Can you say, is there such thing as a normal sinus bradycardia? Yes or no? No. No. So it's either normal sinus rhythm, that's the only one that's normal, but in order for it to be normal, it'd have to meet all of the rules and be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Anything else, whether it's bradycardia or tachycardia, there's no normal. Normal means the heart rate's between 60 and 100. There's no ectopy and all of your P wave and your PR interval, your QRS complex, that's within normal limits. There's no ectopy in the strip. There's a P wave in front of every QRS and it's regular. So it has to meet all those rules in order to be normal sinus rhythm. Everything else is sinus whatever, okay, or ventricular whatever. So don't let somebody trip you up in trying to create new names for things. All right, what, what's this rhythm? I'm gonna let you guys work through it and I'm not going to say it because I've already walked you through. Is it normal sinus rhythm? Okay, I have a normal sinus rhythm on the table. Everyone agree or disagree? And if you disagree, what's your, what's your interpretation option? I agree. I have two agrees. Anyone else? I have two yeses. There are 13, four, uh, 12 students on here. Myself make 13. So I have two folks that say they agree. What about the other 10? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I mean, yes, I, I agree. I didn't see anything in the chat either. So I was just like, okay, am I on this joker by myself? So this is plain normal sinus rhythm. So we have, it's regular. There's a P wave in front of every QRS. The PR interval is within normal limits. The QRS is within normal limits. There's no active P anywhere, no abnormal or early beats. So we're good. What is this rhythm? First, is, is it regular? Miss Hudson? Yes. For the previous one, the normal sinus rhythm, I just want to make sure that I get it. <laughs> so for this one, because the um, first PQRS is not complete, then the heart rate would be, because there's eight of them, it would be 80? That is right. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What's this rhythm? Is it regular? Is there a P wave in front of every QRS? 
what's the PRI, the QRS, comp, uh, QRS interval? Ventricular fibrillation. All right, I have a ventricular fibrillation on the table. Do you all agree? Yes. I agree. Okay. This is V-fib. So this is what it looks like. Completely different than the atrial fib. Atrial fib has a QRS to it. Ventricular fibrillation, it's just, the, it's a lot of chaoticness and there's no rhyme or reason. Some folks go, this is a, this is a PVC. That may be a PVC. Don't go looking for zebras. This, it is coming out of the ventricles, but the ventricles are basically, you know, there, we have no atrial contraction going on. And whatever the ventricles are doing, it is, it's all chaotic. There's no rhyme or reason to what's, what's transpiring. Okay. All right. What is this? Ventricular tachycardia. I have a ventricular tachycardia on the table. Do the other 12 of you agree? I yes. Agree. Okay. So remember before I showed you a different type of ventricular tachycardia? Here's another form. But it's still ventricular tachycardia. It's wide and bizarre. It's almost similar, but it's slightly different because if we go back, Let me let this person in real quick. Oops, oh, she got booted off. All right, so if we go back, see how it had these little indentions here? Now we have one where there's, there's nothing like that. So we have, I mean, it's just wide and bizarre. But this is your QRS complex, and it's just another one, just another one, just another one. This can actually be rotated around and still be VTAC, and that's another formation of it. So, what's this rhythm? Assuming it's actual six, is it a six second strip? Yep. All right, so we got a sinus rhythm with the PVC thrown out. Okay. Uh, so, this is our P, our P wave, and you can see that it's slanted, and so sometimes you actually have to slant your own, your paper just to get the, the reading or the number or whatever. But this is still, you know, normal, this P, the P wave part. But here we have an early beat. See, from here to here is the same. But if you were to measure, if you were to take this point and then move it all the way up here, it should actually fall where the next beat would fall. And then we have this beat and this beat. But this is a wide and bizarre PVC. And it looked uh, kind of different than the previous one. So what would you would do? This would be sinus Brady. Yes. Or sinus rhythm. This should be sinus Brady. So this is not rhythm. Let me fix that real quick. Let me do a stop share because I don't want to fix that. Mm -hmm. All right. Now on the top of that, let's do that. Now I'm going to reshare again. Oops, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that. There we go. Now yeah, we're going to share screen once again. Okay, there we go. Oh, I think I did the wrong slide. Oh, I did. So this should be sinus bradycardia with APVC. And the one that I changed, it should not be. And this is your next one. But what I had this slide for is to show you a couple things. All right, so looking at these PVCs, 
they and you can tell the beat comes early because it's right on the heels of this T wave, but the characteristics of them are the same, correct? Yes. They, so what does that mean? The irritation is coming from the same location. The irritation is coming from the same location in the ventricle. That's what this means. Okay. What about this one? Is the irritation coming from the same location in the ventricles, yes or no? No. No, no. because if this is coming from the same location, this is why it's called unifocal. It's coming from the same point. Multifocal means we have two separate areas of the ventricles that's irritated. This is worse than this one. Now we have a sinus rhythm or maybe sinus tachycardia with two runs of ventricular tachycardia. So remember two, if it was at three or more PVCs in a row, that would be ventricular tachycardia. How many PVCs do we have in the first run? Four. It looks like four. Four, and then we have three in the second. So this is why it's two runs of ventricular tachycardia. Okay. Same, same place of the heart that's irritated, yes or no? Yes. Yes. These PVCs relatively look the same, okay? They don't have to be an exact replica. They just have to look the same. And overall, they relatively do. But I would like to know how often these runs of ventricular tachycardia are happening. Because here we have three beats in a run, three beats in a run, and eventually you're going to have these two. You're going to have here and here happen sooner and sooner, which now it's just going to be straight ventricular tachycardia at some point. So this is a lot of irritation in the ventricles. Questions? No. Okay. So we know what our lethal rhythms are. What are our three lethal rhythms? VTAC, VFib, and asystole. Asystole. That, and I did not put that strip on because everyone knows that one. What is it? It's the flat what? You did. It's the flat line. So everybody knows the flat line. But the ones they usually get confused with is ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. One is not regular at all. It's just chaotic. You can't even get an irregularity out of it. And then the second one, uh, ventricular tachycardia, can have a pulse or not have a pulse. So you, that's why you need to check pulses with them, okay? If a patient has an ejection fraction of 32, is this an increase in perfusion or decrease in perfusion? Decrease. That's a decrease in tissue perfusion. Okay. Where do you normally see patients that with that have what types of patients have low ejection fraction? Heart failure. Heart failure. And what is that uh, test we should get to let us know where they fall in that heart failure? The BNP? 
Yes, so the B-type natriuretic peptide. So that's only elevated when a, the patient has, when you know, the heart failure comes into play. And normal is what? What's the normal rate for it? Less than 100. Less than 100. So do you remember the ranges that I gave you for heart failure when it's like, you know, mild, moderate, and severe? I believe mild was 300, moderate six, and then severe was nine. You all agree or disagree? I agree. Okay. Uh-oh, somebody got a mask on. <laughs> That's too funny. Yep, so three, six, and nine. So 100 to 300 means that heart failure is present. Greater than 300 is mild, greater than 600 is moderate, and greater than 900 is severe. Okay, so if you get a number of 1100, then that is severe heart failure. What's the difference between left and right heart failure? Left is drowning and right is swelling. Okay. So drowning in water from the lungs and swelling is swelling all over. Where is that swelling all over, by the way? Your peripheral, so like your, um, like the hepatomegaly, your legs, your hands, your liver. So we have liver swelling, we have sacral swelling, where else? Spleen, lower extremity as well. So the spleen, the extremities, one more. Ascites, the stomach. And the stomach. stomach. And the, so yeah, everything on the right side and kind of wrap around to the left, those are all swollen. Those areas are all swollen. Will the patient have JVD? Yes. So yes, they will have neck vein distension. So that is another, another sign or symptom. Okay. So, uh, any questions about heart failure? And then we talked about the medications to treat it. What's our, what will we use to treat it? An what ACE inhibitor? An ACE inhibitor. Can, can that be given to all people? No. 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 So, you know, although that may be the best methodology, and although that is their first line treatment for, um, to utilize, especially for right heart failure, then, you know, that may, that may be the right, right thing. What about um, anything else can, that we can give? What else can we give to help get rid of the fluid like in left heart failure? Because left heart failure is drowning. Diuretics. Diuretics. So we need a diuretic. And then what lab value do we want to monitor for? Potassium. Potassium. High or low? High potassium. Increase in potassium. No, well, if you have a loop diuretic, you get decreased potassium because you're getting rid of it. Okay. So it depends on the diuretic use. So if they use potassium sparing, then we need to monitor for hyperkalemia, uh, hyperkalemia. If they're using a loop diuretic, then we have to worry about hypovolemia, right? Yes. Okay. So um, not only can we use ACE inhibitors for heart failure, what else can we use it for? High blood pressure. For high blood pressure. So with these folks that have high blood pressure, we're still gonna monitor or potassium, because here, this would actually cause potassium retention, which means the potassium would be elevated. So we need to monitor patients if, for um, ACE inhibitors if, 
if they're on those, we're going to monitor the potassium levels to make sure they don't become hyperkalemic. Other things we can do to treat high blood pressure. Speak up for me, babe. Lower salt intake. So lower salt intake. So DASH diet, right? So reducing canned goods, processed meats, ham, bacon, all of those would be things that they could look at. Decreasing, you know, kind of increasing fluid intake. That would be something helpful to do. Um, So if we're looking at evaluating a patient's response to the medication that has, you know, left heart failure, and we give them an ACE inhibitor and Lasix, so what would be the best way to look at the effectiveness um, if you were doing an assessment? Monitor INO or weight. Before INOs, before weight. Lung sounds. Lung sounds. So remember, left heart failure is drowning. So we want to make sure they're no longer what? Having rails or crackles, right? Correct. So, you know, make sure you pay attention to, you know, if it's, if they're, you know, if your NCLEX question is right heart failure or left heart failure, so you'll know how to answer correctly. But those ACE inhibitors, you know, promote excretion, so fluid excretion, but it's also going to promote sodium excretion. So we want to try to get rid of the extra volume, but remember, if you're saying it's drowning, which it would be fluid in the alveoli, we want to check the lung sounds and auscultate those to see if that, if the, you know, rails is less um, throughout the lungs. What is the name of that term where you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you're, you're suffocating and you're short of breath? What is that called related to heart failure? Nocturnal something. PND. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Okay. So you have a patient that um, uh, is having heart failure and tell me what other treatments besides medication we need to do for them since they, you know, it doesn't matter which one, this, you know, we still need to make sure that we have this a, a, as a part of their treatment. Like small frequent meals, probably. Okay. And rest. Okay. So what if they're short of breath? We need a cluster care. Okay. What sure the bed, head of bed's actually elevated. Okay, elevate the head of the bed. What else can we do? Monitor weight daily. Okay, so but they're having the shortness of breath now. So they were fine a minute ago, and now they're short of breath. Oh, oxygen. oxygen. We're gonna give them some oxygen. Okay, so they need to, we need to have some oxygen for these folks. So not that anything of what you said before is incorrect, because all of those things are correct. And you remember two to three pounds per day or five pounds in a week, they need to get back to the PCP. That's too much volume, okay? If we're giving them a medication like Captopril, what is some teaching we want to do related to the medication? And before we give our patients Captopril or any high blood pressure medication, what should we do first? Check a blood pressure. pressure. Check a blood pressure manual to make sure that this is, you know, they can actually receive the medication because it can drop their blood pressure about 20 points. So we're giving them this Captopril 
so what would be some patient teaching? What is one of, one of the bigger side effects of taking high blood pressure medication like that? Um, orthostatic hypotension. So yeah, so if we, so are we gonna tell them, we don't want you to get orthostatic hypotension. We're gonna we tell them to stand up slowly and don't get dizzy. Exactly, so we're gonna you know, have them when they're changing positions, don't be whipping around. You know, if they're standing up, don't be you know, just jumping up real quick because their blood pressure can drop and that's not what we want to have, you know, have happen to the individual. Okay, so we have a patient with, this is a, you know, pregnancy induced hypertension. And they start experiencing, you know, uh, swelling and dizziness, headache, seeing spots, which type of hypertension or what has the patient gone now? Preeclampsia. Preeclampsia. So what's the medication used to treat preeclampsia? Mag magnesium. Okay, so we have a patient that's receiving magnesium sulfate for preeclampsia. When would you know uh, what signs and symptoms would the patient display if they're starting to have? Why do we treat with MAG? Let me start with that before you say that. Smooth muscle relaxer. Okay, but, but all right, smooth muscle relaxer. We treat it because of the high blood pressure. So Seizure precaution. Okay, so usually because their magnesium is low it is a it does do all the things that we spoke of so what if you're giving them this magnesium and how would you know that you've swung them to the other side depressed reflexes Repress. what kind of reflex the deep respiration so their deep tendon reflexes would be what we diminished. Depressed. Diminished. depressed or absent okay so they'll have absence in their uh, absent um, deep tendon reflexes what other signs and symptoms would you notice low your oxygen their respiratory rate would be low anything else slurred speech okay they could have some changes in mental status so remember although we may be treating the patient for one sign for one problem especially these electrolytes, if we have to give them electrolytes, then we need to make sure that we're monitoring them for the opposite effect. So if we're trying to treat something low, then we need to be monitoring for you know, potentially something being high, and we need to know what those signs and symptoms are. But the absent deep tendon reflexes is definitely a telltale sign that we now have mag hypermagnesemia, so we need to be paying attention to that. So what about, um, Someone that's still in eclampsia, what type of lab values would they have? Proteinuria. Yeah, proteinuria. Okay. So they'll have some deep tendon reflexes that are, you know, that they'll that will be present. Um, if we have like the low urinary output, that'd be an issue. But you know, normal, what is normal urinary output? How much per, how many milliliters per hour? 30. Okay, so um, other lab values we wanna look at that may be indicative that they may have some in-organ dysfunction would be what? Kidneys would be in creatinine. Okay, what else? Uric acid. Mm, not that one. Then the CBC part. They have low platelet count. A platelet count of 20 is critical. That's critical. But if your platelet count is, you know, normal platelet count is what, 100,000 to 400,000? Yes. So if it's like 50,000, 45,000, 40,000, is that normal? No. No. So we want to report that to our PCP. Okay. All right, 
So um, since we, this is our second time on peripheral arterial disease, so make sure you know the difference between arterial occlusion, venous occlusion, and you know with, uh, if you have a person that you suspect that may have an arterial occlusion in the leg, then what finding would you expect to see if you were to assess them? Call to touch. Call to touch. Pain, pallor. Pulseless. Pallor, what else? And somebody says something else. Pulselessness. Pulselessness, okay, what else? They have the inter, is it intermittent claudication? Intermittent claudication. So what about, what, what would you check in their feet? Oh, no. Refill. Okay, cap refill. Would it be delayed or would it be brisk? It would be delayed. It would be delayed. So, you know, folks that have peripheral arterial disease can literally have, you know, develop ulcers because they're not getting the perfusion as is. So we want to make sure perfusions happen distally to the, the problem. So we can check cap refill to see what's happening there. Um, let's see what else I want to talk about since we're on that on that section. Um, with arterial, I was re reading that you don't elevate their legs, but with oh, venous, you do. Correct. Two different things. We have a clot, and we don't want it to move, so we're going to leave things where they are. But with peripheral peripheral vascular disease, that's a lot of swelling, right? Because and you want to get a girth of the thigh to see how big it's getting. But you can elevate that, but you can also use compression stockings too. Okay. Um, outside of weight for heart failure, just another thought that came to me. Aside, aside of looking at weight, you know, look at the patient have an increase in shortness of breath. Any questions about, you know, the cardiac part? All right. Um, let's talk about the, what's the difference between an, um, an MI and stable angina? MI can last more than 20 minutes. Okay, what, how to tell, tell me more. That's true. You have chest pain at rest. Okay, I like that. So we got chest pain greater than 20 to 30 minutes. It starts at rest, okay. Tell me a little bit more about the chest pain. Um, you don't, there's no relief of the pain. Okay, there's no relief. What does it feel like? It's a crushing pain. Crushing or heavy pressure. So, you know, substernal, so below the sternal area, that's why they look for epigastric pain as well, because of the location that it normally happens. And then we would be looking at radiation to the neck, jaw, arms, teeth, right, back. Those would be some things that we would look at or talk about with the patient. Nausea, vomiting, because it's chest pain for sure, plus one or more of all of the other things. So nausea, vomiting, dizziness, and diaphoresis. So if chest, if unstable angina or an MI happens at rest, then what does a stable angina, where does that start? Exertion. That's with exertion. So still can have, it'll still be that crushing, heavy pressure, chest pain. Same location. The only difference here, I mean, they have, they can have any one of those other associated symptoms that we just talked about, but this chest pain happened because of activity. So treatment is stop the activity, rest. That would be one method to treat it. Whereas an unstable angina or an MI, 
it started at rest, so I'm not sure how much more rest you can you can get at this point. Okay. And then what's our medications we can give? Oxygen. Oxygen, okay. Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, how much? 0.04. So 0 0.04 milligrams, and that's PO or sublingual? Sublingual. Sublingual, or they may put the patient on a nitroglycerin drip. Those are, those are also um, options. So it doesn't necessarily have to be PO. They may just opt for a drip, which means you need to have a patent IV. Okay, so we got oxygen, nitro, what else? Aspirin. Aspirin, how much? 325 or 81 milligrams. So, yeah, so again, get a baby aspirin. So this baby aspirin means it's for babies. Baby aspirin, it's a smaller dose of the larger dose. Smaller dose. It's a smaller dose of the larger dose. That's what that baby part means, okay? All right, anything else? We can give them oxygen, aspirin, and if need be, we can give them morphine to help with some vasodilation as well. So those are not uncommon things that a physician will, will order. But most people look at it as Mona, M-O-N-A, not necessarily in that order. Okay. Um, if we're going to give a patient nitroglycerin, what other questions should we ask about that? If they've taken any erectile dysfunction medications the past 48 to 72 hours? That is correct. At least definitely 24. So uh, any erectile dysfunction medication, so Viagra, Cialis, or Levitra, any of the three, and we need to ask this not of, only of men, but also of women, then that can cause a profound hypotension. It will literally drop out their blood pressure altogether. Nitroglycerin can be absorbed in the skin, so make sure you're wearing gloves if you're going with tablets. Uh, for the individual because you, you don't want to touch it. They also have spray. The spray still delivers the 0 0.04 milligrams. So those, those are options. And then they have paste. Now the paste is a little bit different. So they either go half inch, an inch, two inches um, for the individual. So you have, uh, and they actually have a patch. So, you know, make sure you, you read and know which way the physician wants to deliver that medication. Side effect. What's a, a, a prominent side effect of nitroglycerin? Headache. Headache. So that it's, a, it's not anything to be alarmed about, but just understand that the patient may actually develop a headache and it's common because of the vasodilation or vasodilatory effects that the medication has. All right, so you're at the nurse's station and you see a patient that goes into, you see a, a ventricular tachycardic rhythm. What's the first thing you're gonna do? Check for pulse and respiration. You're gonna go and assess the client. So you're just not gonna call a code yet. Then the next thing you're gonna do is call a code. So check your patient always and make sure that you are definitely having an issue, okay? Um, all right. Let's talk about uh, let's see. Make a trial and miss anything. What's the difference? We're going to go to um, Elimination. I was going to say GI, but it's the same thing. We're going to go, we're going to slide over to elimination. What's the difference between diverticulosis and diverticulitis? Diverticulosis, you actually have the pouches, while diverticulitis, you have the inflammation in the pouches. Okay, so diverticulosis is where you have the weakened walls, which creates the pouches. That is true. And diverticulitis is the actual inflammation of those pouches for which an individual could have trapped food and feces inside of it, correct? So things that we want to, um, how would a person present if they have diverticulitis? What are the signs and symptoms? Left lower quadrant pain. Okay, so crampy pain, okay. 
Fibro. If it's if you have inflammation, yep. Bloating. They can have bloating. They can have bowel irregularity. They can have intervals of diarrhea. You know, those are all signs and symptoms. Okay. So this person may require IV fluids. Can this perforate? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And could they hemorrhage from it? Yes. yes. Yep, yes they can. So what are some causes of either diverticulosis or diverticulitis? Low fiber intake. Low fiber intake. They could have constipation because things aren't moving. What else? Obesity. Obesity, yeah. Old age and genetics. Old age and genetics, those are causes. So all of those components are true. Um, oh Lord, that guy again, this is terrible. All right, so what is an ileus? What is a paralytic ileus? The ceasing of all peristalsis. So we have nothing, we have no muscle contractions happening in the intestines. Is that good or bad? It's not good. Not good. All right, so, um, you know, you can end up with retained feces in there and you'll have bloating and distension and above the obstruction because you can end up with a bowel obstruction from having a paralytic ileus, which is basically the peristalsis not happening. So uh, one of the things they may do uh, or, what, or an intervention you should expect to be a part of your nursing care is to place in a nasal gastric tube. And we need to make sure that that stays patent because you know we're gonna look at what the output is and all of that, but we need to have it in place, okay? So we're gonna look for INOs, if they're outputting anything, consider electrolyte imbalances, but the purpose of the NG tube is to help decrease the abdominal distension, and then let's find the culprit as to why they have a bowel obstruction in the first place. So that would be um, something to monitor for, okay? So I think those are the three things that we talked about there. Um, what, how would you know that the, there's been a perforation from someone that's had an obstruction. The pain. It'll be hard and rigid. It'll be a rigid abdomen. So that'll be a, a very good sign to let you know that, okay, this is, this is now ruptured. And that person can end up with a raging abdominal infection. So that's something we don't want to see happen, okay? All right, perfect. Um, all right, what about um, let's see, something else I want to say about that. There was one other thing. Oh, which um, test? should you not do in the acute phase of diverticulitis? Colonoscopy. Colonoscopy or? Barium enema. Or barium enema. I was like, there's another one. I was like, why can't I remember? All right. Let's talk about neurogenic bladder. I'm having a little crash here. How do folks develop a neurogenic bladder? Spinal cord damage of some sort. All right, so there's several several entities, but yes, yeah, spinal cord injury definitely is a is a a methodology for which a neurogenic bladder can definitely happen. So if you have somebody with a neurogenic bladder, what is our primary goal? Is 
is the bladder functioning on its own? No. So we need to train the bladder, right? We need to train the bladder. We can do Kegel exercises. We could have them do self-catheterization. And if they do self-catheterization, that helps to decrease what? Urinary incontinence or UTIs? UTIs, urinary incontinence. So, you know, doing those self catheterizations will decrease the number of UTIs because if they don't do it, then we're going to end up with urine sitting in the bladder, right? So that's going to be a problem. Um, the person's actually kind of independent in the process. So, you know, they can go to the bathroom, do their in and out cath, and then move on. And it does help them, you know, with self image because with that self-image and self-esteem, if they're peeing on themselves, then that's not going to be good. So that's going to, so those things that self-catheterization definitely promotes it. But then we want to look at going to the bathroom every two hours, not drinking a lot of liquids before a specific time so that, you know, those types of things uh, we also want to utilize or implore with the individuals, but they want, how much should they drink with each meal? How much liquid? About four to 500 milliliters per day. Okay, yeah. about four to 500. So they at least need two liters in a 24 hour period. So we want to encourage the Kegel exercises. They may take pain medicine, or not pain medicine, anticholinergic medicine to help with um, uh, minimizing bladder contractions. What would be that medicine? Is it oxybutynin? Oxybutynin, what's the other one? TCA, tricyclic. Usually it's tal uh, the talrotidine. Oh. So the talrotidine would be the one that they would use the detrol and ditropan to help minimize that. So they'll use intermittent catheterization. They may even give them something for the bladder spasms to decrease the contractions, have them drink at least two liters a day. So we're not gonna restrict fluids. We're not gonna encourage things that cause vasoconstriction like spicy foods, citrus foods, or caffeine. So those things we're not going to utilize, okay? All right, um, how do we treat, uh, if we have mag toxicity, how do we treat that? Calcium. Calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate. Calcium. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right, so we talked about um, I just want to make sure I, for your preeclampsia person, usually high blood pressure, they'll have edema, blurred vision, decreased urinary output, proteinuria, and we don't want them to have what? What is it we don't want them to develop? Seizures. Seizures and we, or eclampsia. And if they have a seizure, then we know we've moved over to the other. We have, we're worse off than what we thought. So, all right. Um, who's at most risk or what types of folks are at risk for hypertension? African-Americans. Okay, besides African-Americans. What other comorbidity can put a patient at risk for hypertension? Diabetes. Diabetes can put them at risk. Okay. So questions about, I think we covered cardiac, we've covered, and don't, I haven't covered the labs, but you're responsible for those. So, you know, checking your book on page uh, 753, you know, all of your laboratory stuff related to, um, you know, coronary artery disease. All right, so how does a patient know that they may have benign prosthetic hyperplasia?
dribbling of the urine. Because this is guys. This is this will be men. The urgency and frequency, but then like dribbling coming out. Okay, so dribbling, ur urgency and frequency. And it takes time for the urine to, to actually for the person to have a micturation or voiding. So it takes time for them to void. So they're standing over the commode, waiting for this almighty pee to come out. And it doesn't. So they'll have urgency, they can have painful urination, and then they're getting up at night. So nocturia, because that prostate is sitting on that bladder, causing, you know, problems. So uh, if you have, if someone says, you know, I've been having some difficulty hearing lately, what should you do as a nurse? And they are not an older client. Assess their ears. Okay, so we're going to look into the ears. All right. Um, what if you can't see the tympanic membrane? And it's ruptured. No, you'll see a hole in the tympanic membrane if it's ruptured. But you know, what if you see, you know, a substance in front of the ear? Earwax. It could be earwax. So what can we do to help improve hearing? Irrigate. So you can irrigate the ear. And you know, sometimes that earwax can sit there so long, it, it almost looks like a blackish brown color, which that is not uncommon. Okay. So things to help folks improve their sleep, what can they do? Sleep schedule. Seven. Okay, asleep. How about a regular routine, a regular night routine? Okay, what else? Daily exercise. Okay, daily exercise. What else? Avoid drinking so much water towards the night. Okay, so decrease fluid intake. What else? French and drinking coffee about three or four hours before bedtime. Okay, so restrict caffeine, um, and especially after 12 noon. That stuff seems to hang around quite a while. What else? Don't stay on like electronics. Yeah, turn your electronics off. I mean, you know, that stuff keeps you wired for sound. And usually if, you know, folks have difficulty sleeping, especially in the middle age group, if they have insomnia, then, you know, you're going to be anxious. You're going to be like, why can't I sleep? You're going to be stressing out. And it's usually because that person has something unresolved in their day. And you don't have to solve the problem. You just have, a, have to have a plan to work on solving the problem. So, you know, as folks move into that middle age sector of their life, then, you know, anxiety and stress related to insomnia is going to be definitely an issue. So sleep, whether you think it is or isn't, is very important. You need to get at least seven hours of sleep per night. And I know some of you are only functioning off of four and five hours of sleep per night, because trust me, I've, I've been in that category. But, um, you know, things to put patients at risk for sleep disorders is, you know, what? Stress or anxiety? Hyperkilogramemia. Hyper Hyperkilogramemia. <laughs> That's not a real word. Um, obstructive sleep apnea. Well, patients can develop sleep ap apnea. So if you are talking, you know, you're trying to educate people about, you know, sleep regulation. People that have any type of central nervous system uh, disorder, that's going to impact their sleep regulation. So 
even if you don't, but if you're not getting the sleep because you're stressed and all of that, that's going to be a problem as well. So if you're anxious and restless, then you're going to end up with impaired judgment. You're going to start making mistakes at the job. I mean, there's going to be a lot of problems that's going to follow that because now you're going to be sleepy at work. You're not going to be able to turn, you know, you're not going to be able to have good high uh, performance. Um, you may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all of because you're, you're on that whole mode when you can't sleep. And it also weakens your immune system. So that opens you up for more conditions like, you know, illnesses and things like that. So um, you may have personal conflicts. Some people are depressed because they can't get the rest that they need. Your tolerance of people literally is you're on that zero mark. You're not even, you can't even get to one or two but they do run the risk of having higher cardiovascular diseases and strokes and substance abuse because of it. So, you know, just um, be mindful about that, about that piece. Okay. Um, patients with cataracts, what are some things after they have the surgery that they should not experience? Heavy lifting. Okay, they should not do any heavy lifting. That's true. What are some other knots? Bending over. Shouldn't be bending over. Sneezing with their mouth open. Okay, so complications is if they have severe pain and hemorrhage. Remember we talked about that? So we don't want them bending over, lifting heavy things, need, need to leave the glasses on, leave the dressing on, you know, as the doctor prescribed, as they said, pre, pre-surgery, when they need to put their um, antibiotic drops in their eyes, you know, we may have to show them how to do that. Sometimes, uh, you know, when you're using certain drops, um, like in glaucoma, they can actually be painful and cause the eyes, you know, to burn a little bit. So this is normal for your glaucoma people. What's the difference between cataracts and glaucoma? Glaucoma is like colored halos. Is glaucoma the colored halos? Or is that cataracts? Cataracts is the cloudy vision and the glaucoma is the increased pressure in the eye. That is correct. So here we're trying to decrease pressure in the eye. That, but, you know, again, those drops are going to be helpful in, in getting that done. Um, and we may need to show them how to do that. And it's the same thing for the cataracts and them having to put the antibiotics so the eyes don't become infected. We're going to have to show them how to instill those optic drops, OTIC. Okay. What is the... What is a normal changing, normal changes with uh, aging? What's the first thing that usually happens? Vision loss? Yes, they have vision problems. So usually with, especially at night. So most people will not drive at night as they get older. So it's like, oh, I don't drive at night. I only drive during the day. Um, so they don't, you know, that's something to, to be mindful about. I know somebody who just didn't want to drive, and I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. Um, hmm. Should you, how do you know if you're having eye problems? Let me ask it that, ask it that way. What are some abnormalities that you would notice? What are normal changes that happen with the eyes versus not? Normal changes, you'll lose uh, nearsightedness. Okay, so people, usually people become more farsighted. That's normal. Okay. We already said, presby is that presbycusis? Is that the one with the eyes? No. I think that's hearing. That's yeah. hearing. Presbycusis is the one with the hearing. But I meant presbyopia, not presbycusis. Presbyopia. That's a normal eye change. Dryness is a normal eye change. 
your lens becoming opaque, that's a normal eye change. What is not a normal eye change? Would it be constant pressure or pain in the eye? Okay, what else? Loss of central vision. Loss of central vision, for sure, or even loss of peripheral vision. So you should be able to have some peripheral vision. And if you have loss of peripheral vision, then you probably have which condition? The macular one. I apologize for that. That, that guy really wish he just had a pole and be done with it. Um, okay, so normally, if you, if you have macular degeneration, then you're gonna have loss of central vision of that crisp focus of things but your peripheral vision is fine. But in glaucoma, you lose peripheral vision. But your central vision, you can see when you start having changes in your, in your eye pressures. So you guys need to go back and look at cataracts and glaucoma so that way you know, you know, who's at risk for it, what types of folks, how do you identify it, how do they treat it? Okay. All right, how do you know, so what are some signs and symptoms of or consequences of sleep apnea? You'll have some behavior changes. Okay. Or judgment. I didn't hear that last piece, but I heard the behavioral changes. What was the second one? I said they'll have poor judgment. Poor judgment, poor performance at work, poor judgment. They could, we said develop cardiac problems, loud snoring. They can develop heart failure. So they're irritable during the day. They fall asleep. If they're not doing activities that are kind of um, like interval stuff, so if it's like the same drone out routine, they'll get sleepy. They won't be able to concentrate. They'll have slower reaction times. Compared to that person and a baby, how, much, how many hours does a baby and infant sleep? 14 to 20 hours. Exactly. So if the baby's up all day long, then I think that's a failure on the parents. So the parents are too, bu too busy Googling and gaga. I let that baby sleep. Like night, night. See you tomorrow. Because otherwise you won't get any rest. And then the child will learn to stay up all the time. So... Questions, comments, concerns, issues. You guys are awfully quiet. No questions. <laughs> so you ready for the test today? Awesome. I love it. Oh, no, I didn't say that either. <laughs> <laughs> You have to have some some icebreaker in here along your way. Hi, Miss Hudson, Miss Tisha. Hey. So um, I aspirated a half of a peanut. Oh, you okay? I, no, I'm. Okay, you you went out, so something sure. happened. Okay, where'd you go? I can't, we can't hear you. Do we need to call 911 for you? Oh, we straight up lost her. 
I see her, her deal is still on. All right, can somebody text her and see if she's okay? Okay, here's a chat. <laughs> Not yo you a lot, Lord have mercy. Uh, Look like she just left the group. Okay, let's see if she comes back. Oh, she's back. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. We uh, can. My internet is unstable. It's just bouncing in. Okay, so let's get back to this aspirated peanut. So it's like a cashew. I don't even like stupid peanuts. I shouldn't even been eating it. And I took a little, they were crumbly. And I just kind of threw them in my mouth and I aspirated one and chewed the rest. And I tried to cough on purpose to like see if I can hack it up like, you know, but I can feel it in my chest, like between my breast area. I can just still feel it there from last night. And I'm like, last night? Yes, it happened last night. So I kept waking up through the night thinking I was going to die. Okay, you need to get off this line. And you need to get that checked out. And I'm getting worse. I'm like starting to sweat now. So I'm like, could I get like pneumonia? You know? Oh well, yeah, you I can, can get, get I'm like pneumonia. Yeah, that can can't happen. hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh shoot! Oh, can Lord. you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Boy. Come on, stupid computer. I can't hear you, but I'm I'm thinking I'm gonna get dressed and go down the street. Okay, that sounds good. I yeah. like that idea. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you need to go and get that checked out. That's probably yes, probably a good call. Never eat another stupid peanut or seed again in my life. Uh, me, keep me posted. All righty. Thank you okay. so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Oh, Lord, that was terrifying. Since last night, I would have been at the doctor's, but I'm glad she realized that's what she, that she, that's exactly what she needed to do. So I'm okay with that. All right. Anything else before we, we break off? Um, Ms. John, Mrs. John sent you guys and eat, uh, well, she posted it in your course board about the level two Q&A session on Tuesday. I will not be able to join that session. I have a, a have an appointment that morning. But if you want, we can meet next week and do Q&A, just bridge only. So it's up to you. Just let me, send me an email. Or actually find up for the entire group is that, if that's what they wanna do and uh, the best time. And then I will set it up on Zoom. Sounds good? Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. All right, so I'll let you finish studying. So, uh, you know, I'm quite sure I did brain overload some more from the brain overload you had on yesterday and the day before. My apologies, but just make sure your cameras and stuff are on. There's a button that you can push to make sure that you're in focus and all of that. So just follow those rules. Your exam is through Examplify. I think I had that with third level today when I did their, um, their Zoom session. But yeah, uh, let's not... Let's not be, I don't want to lose any students because of the funkery. So, so stay woke. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Hudson? Yes, sir. Will you be posting this video on YouTube tonight? Uh, yes, I have to wait for it to convert. Um, I had the Zoom session with my SI students earlier and their file, but it was three hours. Their file just finished converting. So as soon as it converts, okay. I'll upload it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, guys. We'll we'll chat later. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.